Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to The Grow Podcast. I'm your host, Nolan Fast. Uh, today, we've got Sam Hahn back again, and we've got Brian Sherling. Uh, you are the seed department manager, Yes. At a, and you're out of Plymouth still? Yes, Plymouth, Plymouth and Romney. So you recently were promoted. What were you, uh, I know you were in seed, but what were you before? So officially before this, I was the seed operations manager, okay. and uh, which basically means <clears throat> just everything from ordering inventory management um trying to you know make sure everything was uh that we had everything for the growers when they when they uh had ordered their seed we make sure that everything's there all the supply is ready to go um and then just whatever whatever would entail you know getting everything ready for the season and so you're still going to be out of plymouth though yes nothing's Nothing's really going to change on my end, except for maybe just a few more added responsibilities, uh, more so on the business side of our our uh, department and uh, making some of them decisions and, and things like that. So nothing's really going to change with my role, except for some uh, more added responsibility. So how long have you been with the company? So I started um, with the company back in the winter of uh, 2000. So Very specific. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so 20, 20 years. Um, 20 years. And when I started, I started off at the at our Wilbur location. Okay. And uh, so I worked there for <clears throat> um, about nine years and did uh, 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 seed sales, uh, chemical, fertilizer, um, basically just everything that a lot of our other guys do today. But, uh, and then uh, in the winter or fall of uh, 2009, that's kind of when I moved more into a seed only type role where I was doing uh, seed sales, uh, some administrative uh, entering, and then uh, just kind of evolved and got more and more specific and uh, to where I'm at today, I guess. Okay. And so you work uh, in Plymouth with Sam, right? Yeah, Sam, uh, Sam and I have been working together for what, three years, I think. Yeah, this is my third seed season with you. So, so is he good at his job? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm trying to break him in how I want things done. So uh, yeah, I have a pretty under good understanding of how Brian likes things done. So yeah, you know, I think we're good. Are you looking to replace him someday? No, nah, I'm, I'm not <laughs> looking to do anything. I'm, I'm just looking to keep my job. Yeah, no, it uh, it's it's a uh, it's a lot of work. It's more than what a guy re- thinks um, and yeah. realizes. Um, there's a lot to it. It goes behind the scenes type of things and. Uh, Definitely more than a one man one man uh, job, so I kind of need an extra hand. And actually, sometimes we, it's a three man job. Yeah. Um, but uh, when things really get get rolling in planting season, it gets pretty hectic. Yeah, it's definitely sometimes more than a two man job. But uh, just like with the Plymouth location, where the, that's the seed like hub, yeah. all the seed except for bulk beans that go in bulk bins comes to Plymouth, mm-hmm. and then it goes to other locations from there. So we kind of like bring everything in and then ship it back out to our location so there's a there's a lot of seed move through the Plymouth warehouse you know company wide Mm -hmm. so if I've got both of you here who's running the seed shed (laughs) um well it's a little vacant right now but uh we'll be we'll be back there in a couple hours so well yeah yeah, we'll we'll try and get you out of here quick um I want to talk a little bit about uh so today the main subject is going to be kind of cover crops uh pros cons that sort of thing uh before we get to that I uh wanted to look up i looked up uh, some history of like hybrids which i thought was pretty interesting so uh, like before hybrids became a thing um the average yield was 30 bushels or more an acre mm-hmm. and i think now do, what is do you know what the average yield would be in this area oh gosh it you know obviously mother nature has a lot to do with that but and obviously your uh, irrigation and things like that makes a big difference but um, yeah, I don't know what the average would yeah. be. Or <laughs> it's hard to say. It's like I would call it 150 to 250. 150 like on some of your tougher dry land, 250 on some of your better irrigated. Yeah. And, you know, your dry land can get up towards the 200 and your irrigated can be less. But, I mean, it's it's significantly better than so 30 bushels. Yeah, than 30, 30 an acre. You know, I, I guess you're you, you, when you look at our area, you know, we're pretty dynamic with, you know, where we're split with – dry land and irrigated but uh you know as far as a national average you know we're we're, we're doing well for our, our specific areas so well i know uh, i looked up the record in 2019 was a guy uh david hula out of virginia he had 616 bushel an acre corn yeah like 
That how, guy's crazy. How he, do you even like? How do you do that? He he <laughs> spoon feeds it nitrogen and stuff all the time and has excellent fertility and spends a bunch of money on fertilizer. I was wondering about that. Are you like? Is there a limit where you go from like a like a cost effectiveness where you could you're putting in like so you got 616 bushel an acre but like input cost wise like it would be astronomical it would be a lot and a lot of these are a a very small block of say five or ten acres maybe that they're there a lot of them times they're doing it for a uh, uh, like a a contest yeah yield contest so um so he's not looking to make a huge profit off of that probably not he's it's the competition yeah there so but they you know the funny thing is that a lot of the seed companies will tell you you know your 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 greatest opportunities before you open the bag right so the minute you tear open that that seal on the bag your your uh your yield potential probably goes from that 600 down to that that you know the 250 that we're talking about and it's all about risk right so you got uh mother nature you got you got bugs you got disease you got uh uh, wind hail whatever that just basically can take your yields down in, in no time so well now you bring that up uh do you so right now uh like is there anything specifically like that's been a problem this year so far with like bugs or or disease or anything that you guys have seen uh the biggest thing i've noticed is just uh our stands maybe not be quite as uh, on corn, for example, our stands maybe not be quite as good as uh, we had hoped. Um, you know, when you think about plant season this year, it was, uh, it was fast and furious. Yeah. Once it got going, it didn't stop, but, uh, and we had a pretty good going, but it was nice and dry. So, you know, we got, got through it. And uh, so then you started seeing a lot of pivots, irrigation running, just kind of get that stand established. Um, so if a guy maybe didn't have that pivot to run, you know there is some some stands out some out there that uh, could be better, but they're not they're not a train wreck by any means either. When I was uh, I was talking to Scott Heinrich, uh, your boss, um, uh, my boss, yep. This morning and uh, he uh, he said the like the growth rate that we're having trouble keeping up with the the wind. We need to get out and spray, but got to make sure that it's not getting away from us. Definitely getting out there and get everything sprayed. Yep. Yeah, the wind's been a big factor this year, and it's. I think it's been a little bit hard on some of the corn and stuff too. It's just tired of taking the constant beating of the corn, like you said. Um, another thing, though, that you talked about some things going on in fields. There's some thistle caterpillar in the beans again, so we got to be looking for that in our bean fields and see if we need to get some insecticide applied on those because they, uh, you know they hurt a bean field pretty well and they did they did last year too and we're, we're seeing some again so that's another thing we've been aware of as well well i know uh we're gonna be doing our our you know i gotta ask so is it on a pronunciation here because i keep hearing it different ways is it fungicide or fungicide does anybody know well the... is it fungi or fungi because <laughs> you hear it both ways so do, do you like i yeah i keep hearing it both ways i know i just did a uh a podcast a little bit ago with sky tech and i said fungicide and he said fungicide yeah and i don't know i don't know who's right yeah yeah I yeah just yes tomato 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 yeah. tomato so it, yeah <laughs> no, well, either no, no way right wrong. we're gonna be doing uh you know putting out some more information about that coming up here pretty soon uh and i know he, he was telling me that it, it's basically it's super cheap if you're already getting fungicide applied uh, to throw some insecticide in there with it mm-hmm. yeah. and just do it all at once right. mm-hmm. so you can just save. Yep. So if you're, if you're looking in your field and you see some caterpillars, call, uh, call your agronomist and they'll get you hooked up. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to get to the cover crops, but I wanted to bring up this article that I found because uh, last when you were in here, we were talking about the cattle markets. Uh, this is an article from Brownfield Ag News. Um And it was saying that processors are getting almost to the same volume of cattle that they did a year ago. Uh, But their their backlog is anywhere from like two to three months of stuff that couldn't get into the packers. Um, But they're hoping that it should return to normal like later this year. Uh, Have you seen anything picking up or? 
Uh, the price has started to reflect it a little bit. I mean, granted, the summer is not usually always the best price, but um, I there has been some trending. I mean, all markets kind of trended up a little bit last week. I didn't look at them real close, but there, as things get closer to a normal, you know, who knows what the new normal will be. But as we get closer to that point, we'll probably see some, you know, leveling off, leveling or, off, or you know, going up. But you know, there's there's a ways to go with that. But hopefully, you know, things can get to capacity again and we can be functioning. Yeah, and I actually found this. Uh, if you're listening and you don't know about it, our website. Uh, if you go to myfarmerscoop.com or farmersco-operative.com, uh, scroll down the page. There's a button that says Ag News. It's updated. You can see there's all kinds of different links on there, and that's where I found that. Uh, but we'll get into the uh, into the cover crops. So I'm sure most people know what cover crops are, what they're for. But can you give us just like a brief why, like what are cover crops and like what's their purpose? Well, I think it's uh, <clears throat> there's multiple reasons why some guys are are, are doing the cover crops. Uh, you know, number number one one reason is uh, you know with the improved soil health, um, reduced erosion uh, type thing, and then obviously the other the other side of it would be the livestock guys. You know, so it could be a very good source for for feed um, for the for the cattle. And uh, those are, and then the the third the third a- aspect of that would be the governmental um, programs, the CSP programs. A lot of times, there's uh, guys signed up that they can get extra payments if they oh, if, if they put the cover crops crop. in. So those are really probably the three main reasons why why you would look at a cover crop. So I know a lot of people are going uh, going like no till. Uh, you mentioned erosion. Is cover crop a good way? I mean, if you're talking about like erosion and like soil health. Is that like a good alternative to no-till or? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's all, it's all, it's all comes together really. Um, but you know, yeah, you'd be, you'd be planting a cover crop, you know, um, later in the fall after, after harvest or, or even before that in, in some cases with our aerial, um, side of things, we can, we can put on the cover crops with the, with the airplanes through SkyTech. Um, but, uh, so it uh, it's a it's a good opportunity to, to you know reduce that wind erosion uh, throughout the winter. Um, also in the spring, you know we sometimes get them gully washers um, of of rain events, so it can help the soil stay in, in gully washers. Yeah, so that know, is a term I have you, never heard. You've never heard that? I have never heard you, that. You, no. you don't want to have those. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, it can definitely help. Um, doesn't. And then obviously, it's all no no till really um, doesn't replace it or anything like that. Okay. But the, uh, there is definitely some challenge with it, challenges with it as well. But um, uh, yeah, very good source for for uh, soil improvement, soil health, things like that. It's like a companion with no till. Okay. So like you know you go harvest your corn, then you put in your rye or whatever you want to put in. And then that rye overwinters, and then you can kill off the rye, and you can put your soybeans in. And you don't do any tillage. So, and then especially like that'll help uh, suppress weeds. You know, it'll take the weed pressure down most likely because they'll have a crop out there covering the soil, so the weeds won't have a Can't chance to come up. So that that's another reason or another added benefit of it. To it, mm-hmm. is there like any like is there a, any specific like grower that's like best suited or should consider cover crop more than somebody somebody else like or is it just across the board i would say it's not for everybody um because it is a very challenging thing to, it can be challenging i should say um uh some guys are sold on it if they've done it and and done it for you know multiple years they see the benefit of it and it works well in their operation but there's other guys that you know have tried it and it just doesn't fit so um it's got to be something that, that guys are willing to uh, manage and uh, take the time to do it. Um, but it can be a very complex type of thing. So, yeah. And it's not for everybody, I will tell you that. Yeah, because that, that was one of my questions I was going to ask. I don't want to – I mean, obviously we sell it, so we want people to buy it. But I wanted to – if there was a downside, like I wanted to make sure we cover all aspects. Like sure. is there – like what would be the reason not to use it? Well, Go ahead. I just – 
I was just going to piggyback off what he said a little bit too, what, what you were talking about with the people who are going to, who it would be suited for. Obviously me, I would say a, a cattle guy. It's really good for cattle guys. Like even like dad and I have put it on with the airplane before, we'll put oats, turnips, and radishes on while the corn's still sanding. And then when we harvest the corn, the oats, our turnips, and radishes come up and then we put our cows out there and they eat. And, they and then eat those, it. and they eat those things. And those things all kill over winter. So they don't come back in the spring. But it, it it makes a nice feed for your cows and stocks, and then we also will drill like some rye or triticale in the field, and then we'll then we'll harvest it by swathing it and either baling it or chopping it and make feed for the cattle too. So there's definitely added benefits for a cattleman. But as you said, Brian, it, it you have to have some management to it, yeah. And uh, you you got to you know take care of that crop, and then that kind of can segue into the negative part of things, you know. A plant is a plant. You can only grow one crop at a time. Otherwise, it's just two things competing for each other, and you're not going to— For gonna, nutrients. Yeah, for nutrients, you because know, plants compete for water, sunlight, nutrients, or water space nutrients. So, you know, if you're going to have rye out there, you got to make sure that rye is dry, crispy, dead before, before you go you get. before you go plant and do it. Um, and that's mostly—well, soybeans you kind of can do some more things with, but— uh, the rye releases a toxin when you kill it, and if you have corn in the ground, that will hurt the germination of the corn. Oh. So that's one of the negative things. So things to consider. Yeah, mm-hmm. so you if you're planting corn behind rye, you got to make sure the rye is dry, crispy, dead. Um, so that's a, kind of a negative thing, and just like just it, it adds to your management. So, I mean, I think they definitely have their place and have their benefits, but I mean, you have to you have to treat it as a crop. So how long, like soil health wise, like is it, like do you have to do it for a few years before you see an added benefit, or is it the first year you do it? I've been to some tr- meetings and some trainings on cover crops in the past, and um, the, some of the th- one of the things I took away from some of them that I've been to are the the guys that say it, it's it is similar to no till in that don't expect to go and plant a cover crop in one year and fall in love with it and you know, uh, see all these great benefits from it after one year. Just like no-till, you got to do it consistently and uh, for, you know, three to five years potentially to see that see that to benefit, see that benefit start it. to come to fruition. <clears throat> I would say that cover crops are, are, are somewhat similar to that. You need to, if you if you do want to try it, you kind of got to be committed to, to committed to, to give it, it that, and give, give it a chance. Give it a chance. Don't, don't just do it one year and say, oh, it's, it didn't work. <clears throat> I understand that, but... Um, you do really need to give it some time and, and, and try it multiple years to, to get the full benefit from it. So if you grow a vegetable, I mean, this might be a stupid question, but can you eat it? Like, is it like the <clears throat> specific kind of seed that we sell? Like, is that something that like a, as a human you could eat? Yes. If you really wanted to? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can eat field corn and beans. As, I mean, that's so, fair. I mean, it's not, nothing's going to happen to you. Um, uh, as I said before, Dad and I have put in some oats, turnips, and radishes before, and uh, I, I had some friends who who had stopped come by, on. and they would come and they'd pull some out and they eat turnips and radishes, just like, I mean, it's kind of the same. I mean, not exactly the same, but kind of the same you ones you can buy at the store, just yeah. a turnip and a radish. So, I mean, yeah, you can eat them. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily like go into it expecting. Yeah, I wouldn't exactly like recommend it, but you could. But you could. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people with <clears> the. <throat> The corn, and that was a little weird, but... I guess you how dry it is. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. So, like, how, like, how, like, the, I guess, popularity or, like, how widely used is, is cover crops, like, now? And, like, have you seen, like, a progression? And, like, like every year, do you, are you, like, selling more? How's that, how's that look? So, you know, I'd say, you know, cover crops for us <clears throat> started you know, probably seven or eight years ago. And, uh, you know, I remember the first guy that kind of <clears throat> came to us and said, hey, I'd like to buy some rye from you. Kind of looked at him and like, you know, what, what's that? What are we doing here? <clears throat> Started out real slow. Every year it's gotten bigger and bigger. And uh, about two years ago it actually blew up. And yeah. uh, we, we literally could not get enough rye uh, and have enough rye on hand to sell. I would say last year backed off a little bit. We didn't sell quite as much, but if you look at 2019, just the year we went through, it was extremely wet. Um, you know, that that played a fairly big factor into it. You know, guys were just behind, you know, uh, from planting, just was late. 
and just the whole schedule just got pushed back and I think that had as much to do with it as anything but we didn't sell as much a, a year ago as we did um, ha have in the past <clears throat> which is kind of a challenge for us too because you, you just don't know it's not like corn and beans you know where you know you know guys are going to plant corn and going to plant beans you know they need so much and we need know how need to know how much to have on hand right so um the cover crops is is totally different in that we just you don't know until a guy calls for it so it's it can be it can be difficult to to uh uh, to manage, man, manage your inventory and things like that. Well, you said rye, and like you were talking uh, like radishes and stuff. Like, is there a benefit to like what specifically you use as a cover crop, or is it just you the, need to put something? The one thing about cover crops, I tell about every customer that calls in, um, you can make it as easy and basic as you want, or as complex as you want. And and honestly, cover crops has become extremely complex and and, and difficult, really, because every situation is different. Um, one guy will want it just for, just for just purely something to cover the ground um, for erosion and, and things like that. The next guy wants it for, like Sam was talking about, for feed value. And then it, where does it go from there? You can add <clears throat> as many ingredients or as less as you want. So it's, it is very difficult because I think about every single order is, is different. There's not a, really a blanket that covers all. And um, so it, it's, it gets pretty, pretty difficult. Yeah. So switching, uh, switching gears here a little bit, um, talk about hybrids. Um, like what are uh, some of the, the bigger change you have seen in like seed genetics over the past, you know, couple of years? Or is there anything recent that's been, you know, revolutionary? Well, I think you, you just look back and, over I'd say maybe not lot the last couple years but um, the last 10 to 12 15 years I think has been huge um, you know in, in 2012 we went through a, a drought year and uh, you know that year if you were lucky to, <clears throat> you maybe be lucky to get 50 bushels an acre on corn okay. or something like that I you know when you talk to guys that went through that you know um, if that would have been 10 years prior to that you probably would have been looking at a lot of zeros or five to ten bushels so I think just the the overall ability for hybrids to tolerate um, stress I think is greatly improved um, whether it be heat stress drought stress uh, of course you know you got your insects and, and disease um, it, it's all gotten so much better over the last 10 10 to 12 years um, you know, we talked about average yields. Well, when I got in the business in 2000, talking to growers, you know, maybe their yield goal at that time was 170, 180, 190 maybe. Yeah. Now, when you talk to guys, what you know, what's your yield goal? A lot of times they'll say 220, 240, 250. In some cases, 260 more. I mean, just yeah. the yield potential has gone up so much. so much. And I think higher. a lot of it has to do with uh, improved genetics. Um, to be able to, to uh, uh, you know, take on the risk and uh, stuff that we've had, but they they have vastly improved over the last few years. I would say the biggest thing too, like you said, is hybrid vigor. That's how tough they are and how much they can handle drought and things like that. You know, the, the corn traits as far as like rootworm and stuff like that and chemical tolerances haven't changed in a dramatic amount that you're most, um, Mostly still spraying with the same type of chemicals. There might be new formulations, but they're still the same uh, chemical families. So I would say just like the the overall yield potential of stuff has just gotten better and better, and then still some of the tougher hybrids. And I would say if you switch gears to soybeans a little bit, um, like you're talking about when you first got in, you know, it was, you know, I don't know how much Roundup Ready beans were a thing then. I mean, I can remember when like dad or neighbors had to call each other and you would figure out who was planting roundup ready beans and who was planting conventional beans so you didn't kill the conventional beans with your roundup and then just out of soybeans the last few years we got you know there's the roundup readies have kind of gone away and there's extend beans and there's enlist beans and then there was liberty beans and there's gtl 27 beans and so there's some there's some more things now that you can spray on your beans that nobody you really couldn't have you know six seven years ago it was mostly just roundup you could spray and now you can <clears throat> spray some more things so that's been and 
that's been a, a big factor, especially as Roundup has gained some resistance and we've had some weed pressure coming. It's been nice to have the tools to use some other herbicides. Are there any, like, do you, I mean, do either of you have any, like, concerns with, like, how high, like, hybrogenetics are going or any worries or figure just keep letting them? I mean, I, I think you're going to see continued um, – continued improvements upon what we have today so you know you sam brought up you know insects as far as rootworm corn borer things like that they're always coming out with new and improved things because um there, there's currently resistance in some of our traits to to rootworm uh things like that so they're they're always trying to come out with new and improved versions to uh help reduce the risk of uh, becoming resistant to those and um we're, you know, we're starting to see some of those every few years. There's something, a, a certain company comes out with an improved uh, trait version, and uh, that's going to continue on. The, the amount of money and research putting into genetics and those types of things is astronomical right now. Yeah. And so it's it's a great thing for the uh, American farmer to be able to take advantage of those those traits and things that have, that have helped him along the way. So uh, right now, I mean, my drive to work, you know, corn's getting pretty tall, beans are looking pretty good. Is there anything you want people to maybe like get out and scout for, look out for? Any issues like coming up that maybe you would suggest that they uh, look for and stay on top of? Like I know you mentioned the caterpillars, but is there anything else out there? I would say, I mean, just in, as we finish up posting our corn, just be looking at your beans if you're you know don't let the don't let the weeds get tall and don't get behind on spraying them and uh like i said the caterpillars and the corn you know it'll be more vital later to look at the diseases and stuff like that that are coming with like you know gray leaf spot or southern rust or even there's some you know there's some corn bugs too like some aphids and stuff like that as you go on just just take a look i mean you don't have to be anything too intense but just kind of recognize if there's something going on in your field or if you got a problem it, you know it's always something that um every year is different and every year brings it along a challenge and i'm sure this year will be no different as we look at you know potential risks of insects or disease um some years are worse than others and uh you never know what what we may have just you know a lot of that's predicated on our uh, on our mother nature and weather events that we have you know some diseases like cool and wet and some like warmer or dry so um, you know, time will tell, but, um, you know, I would say just keeping, keep an eye on your fields is, is when, when the corn gets close to tassel time, that's kind of the critical, uh, stage to start, uh, thinking about doing that application of a fungicide. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be very important then. And, and being wise, um, you know, as we mentioned, the, uh, thistle cat, you know, there's always, you know, there's stink bug, there's Japanese beetles, there's grasshoppers, there's, you know, it's always something it seems like so just just be prepared and we usually don't know it until it hits um so that's well i know like you, you mentioned fungicide we're going to be uh we've got another uh, video we're going to be putting out here pretty soon so keep an eye out for that uh and that'll that'll dive a little deeper into into fungicide and you can put and he talks about uh putting pesticides in there with it so we'll we could we could probably talk for another hour about that um on the on the lighter side of things, we talked a little bit about sports in the last episode. Are you uh, obviously Sam's in the football? That's his sport of choice. Like, what are you What are you missing the most out of right now? Oh, you know, I I enjoy you know watching baseball in the summertime. You know, yeah. on TV, I'm a, I'm a huge Royals fan, so uh, you know, I've always enjoyed watching them in the evenings uh, when you get home from work and turn the TV on watching some baseball. It's always fun. You know, we were just talking on the way up here, you know, College World Series would have started this last weekend. That's always kind of fun to follow. Um, of course, we won't have that this year to, to kind of watch and follow. But <clears throat> so that's uh, something that, you know, in the current present time and as far as, you know, the future, you know, I think a lot of people, including myself, you know, Husker Husker football is is king. So uh, hopefully we get to watch some football this uh, this this fall. You know, I'm 
looks, it's looking like that's going to happen. It's just a question of, you know, will you be able to do it in person and how many people will be able to be there? Or will you just be able to do it on TV or what? But that's probably the biggest question right now is, you know, how many fans will be there? And, and uh, Well, talking about that, uh, I actually found an article. You tell me if this is something that you would use. I don't know that it's, it exists yet, but uh, it's being developed in Japan, and it's an app for your phone. And uh, I, I think I read it maybe wrong at first, but it seems like there's you have different buttons for different emotions you want to convey. And so, say they're out there, they're playing the fo- you know playing football. There's speakers all around the stadium, and so if something happens and you're excited about it, you got to reach down on your phone, find the button that says like cheer or excited. You hit the button in the stadium, it'll cheer. I don't like. I thought maybe it was like you get to cheer into your phone, and it would you would hear yourself you know but i'm pretty sure it's like a canned audience cheer Mm. (laughs) you think that's something that you would use i I assume you can boo too i mean you there's no way it could exist without some kind of heckling well personally i i I don't think i probably would i'm not that much (laughs) of a tech techie you know i i use my phone obviously and and like doing some of those but like i'm not a huge app person that spends a lot of time on them so Personally, I'd rather just be there in person to cheer on, and if I'm not, I'll just sit at home and you know watch it, watch watch the game on TV and cuss at my cuss at, my at the TV. TV. But I'm not probably gonna <laughs> keep worry. your heckling to yourself. Probably not gonna worry about doing it to uh, through an app. Yeah. Personally, Sam might be different. But oh, I'd download the app to see it. <laughs> just I, I, to try I'd download it. it and try it. I don't know that I'd use it, but I'd probably download it. I mean, if you're in the moment, like, could you really break yourself from the like? You'd have to, because then it'd be delayed. Because, you know, they score a touchdown or some crazy play happens. Your first thought's not going to be like, oh, i got to pick up the phone and hit a button so that they know exactly how I feel. <laughs> right. right? Like, it'd that, be a little, that's, that's true. It'd be a little odd. Uh, well, and it'd be like five seconds after it happened. Yeah, because you've got to think there's some kind of delay. Well, the TV delays, I don't know, it's a few seconds. Because if you play the radio and the TV at the same time, the radio's, there's a delay. The radio's ahead of the TV by a decent amount. So, so and then... Uh, this morning, I don't know if you've ever Googled yourself. I didn't get a chance to watch any of them, but just out of curiosity, everybody, if you Google Sam Hahn, you can see some. I haven't watched them. I don't know what you say, but I know in the thumbnail there was a there was a picture of Sam Hahn a few years ago wearing his uniform, looking looking pretty tough, talking about I assume a game you just had. I would guess if I was in uniform. You don't even know. You had a game. See now, now when you leave here, you're gonna have to Google yourself. Oh, I, that'll be all right. There's some, <laughs> there's some great videos. So is there, is there anything else you want people to think about to know when it comes to the cover crop? Uh, you know, your final word. <clears throat> I would just say, uh, you know, we're going to be coming up on the time that, uh, you know, we'll start to put these, you know, apply these or, or plant them. So just be thinking of that as we approach it, you know, ideally, you know, timing wise, um, a good time is after say wheat harvest um, as guys take off their wheat or you know silage starts coming off you know obviously we have a a, a few uh, six weeks or whatever till some of that starts to happen but you know it'll it'll get come up on us quick but um, just be thinking about as, as we move forward you know like I said the wheat stubble um, uh, ground that's taken off for silage uh, you know if you got bare ground a lot of guys will like to come in and, and plant something on those acres and of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do uh, apply cover crops with the, through the aerial uh, side of our business, um, which has gotten pretty big over the last few years as well. Um, so, you know, as, as you're thinking about that, that timing wise on that's usually that first mid, mid uh, early to mid August is kind of when we start firing up the plane to put on the cover crop um, through standing corn, standing soybeans, things like that. And then obviously, if you if that's not uh, work, does if that doesn't work into your operation, um, then we get into after harvest. Okay. Um, and and I would just say, you know, if you're interested in uh, any questions or comments, talk to your local um, farmers cooperative agronomist or salesman, um, and then uh, we can start getting seed lined up. And uh, you know, you never know on supplies and inventories. Uh, like I said, two years ago, stuff was pretty tight and hard to get um last year not so much it was pretty abundant but just be thinking ahead and and uh, you know if, if you're interested in, in locking some supply up just talk to us and we'll get you get you squared away all right well all right well i appreciate you both coming in and i appreciate everybody listening uh remember if you 
if you're watching on YouTube, you can and you want to listen on the go, you can find us on Apple Podcasts. That's on iPhones, or Spotify works on iPhone and Android. Uh, and then with the volatility in the markets right now, uh, it's a good idea to stay informed. Every week we do a, a weekly grain recap. You can find it on our website, uh, myfarmerscoop.com. Uh, it's on the homepage. Otherwise, hit up our YouTube channel and just subscribe. Uh, and that's easiest. You'll get a notification every time anything drops. So a new podcast, new grain report. Otherwise, if you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we post all that stuff. So if you know somebody that uh, you'd like to hear from or if you'd like to come on yourself, we'd love to have you on. Uh, just let us know in the comments, uh, in a review, send us an email, whatever you got to do. Uh, we appreciate you listening. Keep growing.